Good evening, my name is Taylor Jackson and I am Director of South Carolina Logistics, which falls under the South Carolina Council on Competitiveness. Tonight I will be talking about technology trends in logistics and supply chain and how South Carolina is responding to this. I hope you guys enjoy. Thanks. All right, good evening guys. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, sorry, Susie couldn't make it. Um, she has an 8 a.m. in Aiken, so you guys are kind of stuck with me for the evening. Um, but my name is Taylor Jackson and I'm director of South Carolina Logistics. So I know Susie spoke with you guys last year. Um, some of you guys may have been at that, but um, I'll kind of recap and give you guys a brief overview of SC Competes and the team. So within SC Competes, we have five signature clusters, uh, Transform SC, SC Aerospace. Uh, Steven Askenborski right here is the director. He sits in Greenville, um, SC Logistics. We kind of have a joint one between SC Tech and Cyber SC, um, and then the South Carolina Fraunhofer USA Alliance, which is kind of a joint partnership between the council, Fraunhofer, which is a German research institute, and then the Department of Commerce. So within the team, um, as you guys can see here, Susie Shannon's our CEO. We have a number of people that make up our communications um, department, uh, spearheaded by Adrian Beasley, Amanda Campbell, and Alex Albright. We are kind of spread out throughout the state. So I actually sit in Charleston. We have a few people in Greenville, and then the rest of us are in Columbia. All right, so we accomplish our work in three primary ways. Um, actionable research, support of industry clusters, and education and workforce development. So within this, we kind of accomplish this by strategic engagement with our partners. So Stephen has his own advisory board. He has his own partner network. Each cluster is kind of set up differently. Um, so I have partners um, in an advisory board that sits within my partner network. Chuck was once upon a time before his retirement part of that board. <clears throat> uh, actionable research, we do economic impact research studies. So anytime you hear the governor or somebody from commerce um, spouting out some statistics, that's usually coming from our studies that we do with Joey, Dr. Joey Von Nessen with the University of South Carolina. Uh, we do some asset heat mapping. So right now we just finished our technology piece and we, um, we basically heat mapped every technology company, education, et cetera, within the state of South Carolina. So next up will be logistics. We'll be doing that within logistics. And I'll touch on it um, later on in my presentation, but we're actually going to be doing that within um, electric vehicles and e-mobility as well. So what do you, mean by heat map? <clears throat> you go to uh, map and you can scroll over and you can search within, it's, it's basically like a global search engine. Okay. But you can, you know, if you wanted to know all the warehousing companies within South Carolina, our map will show you how to do that. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll flag that for you. Okay. Um, and then education and workforce development. So we work with Tallow or SC Future Makers. We work with, I work pretty closely with Clemson, College of Charleston and University of South Carolina, um, as well as Trident Tech. Um, so I'll kind of fly through these um, pretty quickly. Transform SC is kind of our business tying education policy director um, together. Um, it's basically collaborating with business to improve education. So Dr. Peggy Torrey leads that up. SC Aerospace. Um, Steven, do you want to tag, tag this one? Yeah, sure. So we're... Uh, um, <laughs> So SC Aerospace, so we're, we're just a collective uh, or cluster of the, um, over 400 aerospace um, firms, nonprofits, educational institutions, basically anything that um, makes something to fly uh, is an airport so that things can fly out of it, uh, educates people on how to fly, educates people on how to make things that fly. Um, so uh, you can see kind of an overview of some of our major, more well-known companies um, right there. But, uh, um, and, and like SC Logistics, the panel will get into, uh, we have an advisory board of uh, um, right now 17 aerospace leaders from across the state um, that, that kind of help guide and shape what we do. So, anything else? 
perfect. Thanks. Uh, so this is kind of just an economic impact uh, from 2020. So we did, we, we repeat, um, the we refresh the economic impact studies every three years. So we, had, we did tech, aerospace, and logistics in 2020, um, pre-COVID numbers. So we'll be, you know, redoing those next year, um, highlighting how the pandemic um, helped or hurt some of the industry. Here's the uh, South Carolina Fraunhofer USA Alliance. Um, they're basically important to economic impact. Uh, they get money from commerce every year. It's at $2 million a year right now that they will match with companies. So if you have a project that you think your company could qualify for um, and you only want to throw out a certain amount, they will match that. So you do have to apply for it. So, you know, Nephron Pharmaceuticals, BMW, Samsung, um, GMP Trucking, um, Bosch, and then they partner with a um, South Carolina-based college as well. Um, and Suzanne Dickerson is the director for that, and she sits here in Greenville. Uh, this is SC Tech. It's our newest cluster. Um, so you can see here kind of the average annual employment growth, the numbers from the economic impact study. Uh, Kim Chris, she sits out of Columbia. She's our director for that. And finally, we have SC Logistics. And within the council, the council is a nonprofit. We're a 501c3. Um, so we work private and public collaboration for this. So within SC Logistics, um, we kind of mapped out five, par five main priorities. Uh, managing, marketing, and connecting the logistics cluster. Growing the logistics cl cluster. Expanding the talent pipeline to serve logistics. Promoting competitive infrastructure and business environment and then featuring and enhancing research, innovation, and technology solutions. Um, and as I said, I have an executive forum. Um, so I have representatives from BMW, GSP Airport, Norfolk Southern, Alliance Consulting, CH Robinson, Southeastern Freight Lines, Continental, and Sunland Logistics. So these are the um, 2020 economic impact study results specific for logistics. And so when Susie and I were thinking about what to talk about tonight, we kind of really wanted to focus on this up here in the right-hand corner is South Carolina logistics increasing reliance on technology. So you guys can see from 2010 to 2020, uh, logistics companies within the state have tripled their spending with logistics and technology. Um, so this kind of goes into you know, the future of supply chain and where we see transportation going. Um, as you guys can see, logistics also has about a 30, over a $37 billion impact. And when we did our economic impact study, we only look at companies with 10 or more employees. So we actually think this number is higher, but we don't account for companies um, with less than 10 employees. As I mentioned, a lot of our work ties into workforce and education initiatives. Um, so our latest partnership that we did with Department of Commerce and Tallow was Road Trip Nation, um, and it basically is a bright green RV, and they have they pick students to tour South Carolina businesses. Logistics is one of those um, sections that they're highlighting this year. Um, we also have actually Chuck and Suzanne Dickerson went down to Georgia, I think, in 2018. Um, it was right before I came on. Um, to get brushed up on the logistics programs, lemonade supply, and cell phone supply chain game. Um, Chuck and I have gone into, I think, yeah, over 25 schools since 2019, and that's K through 12. So we go in, we really target fourth and fifth grade. We have done middle school, and then we've done all levels of high school. And we'll go in, uh, Chuck will help me out, and he gives a, an amazing presentation. Um, going over what supply chain is, what logistics is, why it's important, and then the students actually get to participate in a hands-on activity highlighting what supply chain is. So it's pretty cool. We get a lot of really good feedback on that. Um, we've done the Teach a Teacher, so we've gone into a teaching um, conference and showed the teachers, um, talked to them about what supply chain is and why they should um, you know, elaborate for students on that. Um, there's also a CTE focus that we have. There's just a few districts in South Carolina that have a CTE um, set up for logistics. Uh, 
career and technical education. So um, think about like when you guys went to school, you had home ec and something. So South Carolina is starting to have uh, SREB, which is Southern Regional Educational Board. Um, they have a curriculum specific for K through 12. Uh, Pickens Career Center has an amazing program. They actually brought down about 20 something students to Charleston um, and Chuck came down with them and we toured the new Walmart facility, we toured Boeing, we toured Southeastern Freight Lines, um, Keon, which is a manufacturer of forklifts down in Charleston, and then we hosted a industry dinner for them. I had a friend that um, owns a restaurant, he closed it down for us, and so I invited about six or seven colleagues from the industry to meet with these students and to network and talk to them about supply chain and their future careers. So, that was pretty cool. Um, I'm hoping to do that this fall with the CTE program up from um, Rock Hill. So that's kind of my goal. Charleston County has a brand new one at their Cooper River Center. It feeds into the Charleston County High Schools. It started in 2020, so it's brand new. The teacher came all the way from California for it. Uh, he does only have about four students right now, but um, it's an SREB curriculum as well. So when they leave that class, they'll be OSHA certified. They have a forklift simulator within the class. It, it's pretty cool. So we're hoping to get that kind of up and going and kind of recruit some more students for that as well. Any questions? And you guys can ask questions throughout this. No, nope. good. All right, so focusing on emerging trends in logistics and technology. So I've highlighted here a few of the newest buzzwords. Um, I'm only going to focus on a few of these tonight. Uh, obviously, you know, artificial intelligence is very important, the Internet of Things, uh, machine learning, control tower, and management systems. So within this, you know, every supply chain manager knows that digitalization within the supply chain is important. The supply chain can encompass a lot of data. So how it, how it is used and the visibility in this is key to supply chain moving forward. Um, as you guys are aware, COVID really drove many of the changes within the logistics and supply chain sector in the last couple of years. And a report done by McKinsey says that the industry will actually need to be completely digital to secure its future, which is kind of crazy to hear about, um, especially because it's one of the essential businesses. So, you know, you had people still going into the office in the middle of COVID. So to hear the digitalization, um, it's kind of crazy. But Many logistics companies are held back by outdated systems to move fast enough to keep up with this. And a lot of it has to do with price as well. So I'll start with e-commerce. Uh, so as you guys can see, the parcel volumes went over 100 billion pieces in 2019. Uh, they believe that this will more than double and reach 20, 220 to 260 billion by 2026. Um, I think it'll actually cross, I think e-commerce, I read somewhere that it actually is crossing a $1 trillion uh, this year that they expect it to do that. Um, so obviously COVID accelerated some of these adoption technologies, but customers wanted faster service. They wanted real-time visibility. You had, you know, grocery stores going digital during COVID. So real-time visibility, you've got Amazon, Walmart which goes into the warehousing and automation. So companies are locating their warehouses in their DCs closer to centers of population and the industry is shifting to automation. So within that, you have two types of automation. You have the digital automation, which is software and electronics, warehouse management systems. You have physical automation, which is the automation re equipment to reduce employee labor. So think, you know, robotic pickers and packers, laser guidance systems. Um, and a lot of this, if you go in with the mobile robots, it creates a safer environment for the employee and it also leads to less error on there. So the overall purpose that we're seeing within warehousing and automation is to create the better utilization of resources. It reduces the operational and labor costs and it also optimizes warehouse space and it improves the environment and can reduce inventory loss. <clears throat> with more shortages of time, people, and skills, industries are pressured to do more with fewer resources. So with augmented reality, smart glasses, expert knowledge can be captured and transferred into step-by-step -step work instructions that your employees can follow real-time, anytime, from anywhere. So with this, I've um, 
with the new Walmart Center down in Charleston, it's actually not that um, automated. The one I've read that's coming up here, the grocery one, I think it's a $250 million investment. They're going to be highly automated. And they're planning to open that, I think, in Spartanburg County in 2024. Um, but they are already in certain cities deploying drones for pharmaceuticals. So the drone will take it and you can actually program where you'd like the drone to drop off your medicine. And Walmart provides that in some cities across the U.S. right now. There's a few companies in South Carolina that are doing really cool things within this. And every year in April, we highlight down in Charleston, we have a SC Logistics Tech Talk. Um, so we had a company out of Rock Hill called New Forge Technology. They're doing the augmented realities. So they're doing the safety glasses and programming everything from that. You have Fast Fetch right down the road in Seneca. So they're doing the robotic pickers and packers and voice technology. You have Gnosis Freight, which is new, and they actually spoke last year and this year at Tech Talk. Um, they're basically doing real-time uh, visibility within the supply chain on a door-to-door -door or a port-to-port -port situation. Charleston. Charleston. They're in Charleston. Um, and they actually, when they spoke last year at Tech Talk, I think they got like three customers out of it. And they're just saving a ton of money, a ton of time um, with those resources right now. So lots of really cool things happening in this sphere. And like I said, the Tech Talk that I host every year is kind of meant to highlight homegrown companies that are working in this field. In Gnosis? Yeah, or in, in anything that's, that's, that's coming up. Because I was at the um, summit, the global summit, mm -hmm. and they seem to think that they're going to start with AI and adding AI is going to help increase productivity, efficiency, and everything like that. So, I mean, how much of it are you seeing in any of these times? Oh, a lot. I mean, a lot. I mean, it really is just, it's data. I mean, Gnosis is pretty much doing everything by code. Um, the New Forge technology, I mean, they're able to, what they basically did with these glasses is they were able to bring engineers that couldn't travel to places. They could hook it up to the glasses from where they were located and they could help a company out in Michigan or South Carolina or Ohio and they didn't have to be there anymore. It all was able to be seen and taught through these glasses. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool and a lot of it's happening and I'll actually circle back to the AI piece because we um, are, we were just awarded this year a artificial intelligence grant that we'll be rolling out with the help of the governor's office that I'll speak about in a few minutes as well. So. That was, that was another question I had, sorry. Uh, was it, like for small companies, they got Amazon and Walmart that are like, you know, just changing the game. Like, are there subsidies and kind of like grants and things that are coming for smaller businesses that are able to implement this type of stuff that are the yeah, there are. I mean, yeah, there, there's, yeah, there's grants out there. Um, I know that the state's looking at a number of incentives programs as well for it. And a lot of these things, like, I mean, Gnosis, um, and I keep picking on them because I'm, I'm pretty familiar with their work, but um, they can tailor theirs to the customer. So it doesn't have to be, you know, 700 containers a year. Um, it can be kind of as small or as big as you'd like because they make it specific. And then they charge by, it's not just one flat fee, they adjust it to what level of service you'd like from them and what kind of, how much details you want from them, so. If we can follow up after, if, if there's a small company that's looking to, to, you know, take like an AI leap or something like that, one of my partner companies actually is Delta Bravo based out of Rock Hill that, that does stuff like that and sometimes with Fraunhofer, like Taylor was talking about, Fraunhofer can be the vehicle to mm -hmm. on that um, if it's under the, the, you know, header of a research project, um, you know, Fraunhofer can, can be a way to secure funding for, for something like that. Yeah, you don't have, for Fraunhofer, you don't have to have like a $250,000 project. You can have a small one and they'll, they'll adjust and, and go with you on that, so. And within the Tech Talk this year, we actually hosted the state's very first uh, B2B business to business matchmaking event with Department of Commerce and SCRA. And so what I did is I reached out to manufacturers. So I had JTEC, I had Volvo, I had Scheffler, I had Michelin, um, I had Nephron, but then I had a pretty small company called 12 South. They import in um, 
cool iPhone, like accessories and leather goods and covers. And within that, we had about, we had seven, oh, like, you know, manufacturers, businesses. And then we had 24, I think, technology companies that were working within the logistics sphere. And it was a two hour event, sold out. Um, it went, I mean, it, 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 I was a little nervous. It was my first one doing, but it went fantastic. And these companies, um, I mean, I had a, one of the larger companies reach out to me today asking how to get back in touch with one of the companies that they saw there. So it was pretty cool. It was really exciting to see we'll keep doing that. And you have to be a South Carolina company. So that's kind of what we hope to do is, you know, allow, you know nurture that and promote S at South Carolina at the end of the day. One, one comment in reference to those who played when they had the uh, SC Tech Talk, Chris X came down and saw all the different things that they were doing and started asking major questions because there's a lot of good cost savings that he could do mm -hmm. with Michelin with international freight. And thinking, I mean, it was just unbelievable what yep. Gnosis was able to do. So I don't know whether he's working with them now or not, but uh, unbelievable yep. the amount of information they have. Yep. So and, um, within this, you have cloud management and AI, and this really just shows the potential of data. So I got a few statistics. Um, global logistics is about 12% of the GDP, or about 9.6 trillion. Um, and log only, logistics technology is only about a 17.4 billion market worldwide. So that uh, you know, reaches out to approximately 0.2%. So while there are great improvements happening in this, it is still relatively small, especially if you think back to that McKinsey study about how the supply chain will go completely digital at some point. Um, and I just really liked this quote, um, every company is now a software company to some degree. Um, so you know you can't build everything from scratch. And then I did a cool little picture of Spot, the Boston Dynamics robot dog. And That'll tie into the Palmetto AI corridor that I speak about in a minute. But part of our grant that we got is we get to buy one of these for the council. So, and then we will uh, have a K through 12 naming competition. So we'll get the students excited about it. They'll be able, we'll take it out to the schools. They'll be able to look at it, play around with it. Um, and then we'll loan it out to businesses and everything as well. So pretty excited for that. I really hoped we had got we got it in time for Tech Talk, but we did not. So supply chain issues, as, as you guys all know. Um, but I'm pretty excited about that. But basically, the importance of cloud management and AI is it saves time and it frees employees up to do other tasks. So I think when you first hear about digitalization, your first instinct is to say, it's going to take my job. And it really just frees you up to do other things and it creates more efficiency for you guys while reducing the human error. So if you think back to the Internet of Things, it's going to help with the various connections between all aspects of the supply chain. So companies that are already utilizing the supply chain knowledge management systems can already respond to supply chain difficulties in real time. So with a cloud-based system, you're able to immediately notify operators, you're able to build transparent supplier relationships by automating the information exchange, and you can easily manage your vendors. So it kind of is a top to bottom, bottom to top approach. So workers can then complete site specific orientation, you can do training online before they physically set foot on, set, on site. Um, Analytics also can help companies monitor supply and vendor capabilities and track data on a supplier's compliance or performance. So traditionally, traditionally that may have done all, been done on Excel, all through paper records, um, and it, you know, it could take a long time to find that. So now, as I mentioned with the glasses, you, you're able to easily pinpoint where maybe something is going wrong and fix it. Now to the latest buzzword, uh, E-mobility. So I heard, I heard you talking earlier about your electric car and how much you love it. Um, it's, a, it's a brand new thing, right? You've got Volvo down here in the low country talking about it. You've got BMW up here. Uh, Rivian just made a huge investment into Georgia. You've got Hyundai, Toyota, Ford. So you've got all these major players. Um, Tesla, obviously Tesla, their new trucks are coming out I think late next year. It only costs about $20,000 to reserve, to, just to reserve you one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so South Carolina's automotive industry has been a principal driver for the state's economic growth. 
Um, since 2010, it had a total growth rate of 186%, which is higher than any other southeastern state. Uh, right now, we are actually working with Governor McMaster's office on an e-mobility study. Uh, Dr. Joey Von Nessen with the University of South Carolina will be completing that for us. Uh, I have seen some of the findings. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff, and we hope to share that with our networks uh, later this summer. Um, as you guys know, the production of electric vehicles has increased dramatically over the past decade. Uh, this is because of technological advances, increased competition, and then obviously the increased emphasis on various government and private sector-based sustainability goals. Um, some of the good things will, that will come out of this with EV production, uh, it's more technically advanced, so it'll require a more complex production process, which means a pivot. The study did find that a pivot towards the production of EVs would likely generate high-skilled jobs that are estimated to pay as much as 40% more than the average wage across all jobs in the automotive industry today. So, pretty high numbers. Um, what is the state's plan for the infrastructure? <laughs> because, I mean, it's awesome that you can target, you know, at home. That's the best thing about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, even though some gas stations I see are putting them in, in charging stations. But I mean, if you can roll up and get a burger at Burger King and charge at the same time. Right. That's awesome. Right. Um, yeah, as you guys know, the infrastructure bill has a ton of money pouring into this sector. So DOT is going through a number of grants right now. I'm actually sitting on a call tomorrow that's going to sift through all the grants that are available for companies, for individuals, for you know pr the private sector, for the towns, the cities, the municipalities. Uh, the, we also took part on the Office of Energy for South Carolina. They had a stakeholder meeting all throughout last year. Um, and the, they will be doing, I think their recommendations will come out later this fall. I'm thinking maybe August or September. I'd have to double, I'd have to check with them on that. Um, but there'll be, rec there'll be a series of recommendations that they hope to make to South Carolina. I think you could. So there's a really cool thing. It's called a forecourt. The U yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's a really cool concept that's happening in the UK and Europe right now. It's called the um, it's a forecourt, and it's basically like a glorified rest area. So it's it, it's got a business center. It's got the electric char. It's sh and it will be just for electric. Um, but it'll have a business center. So like while you're waiting on your charge, you can type emails. They'll have shopping. Um, restaurants, etc. So I know that's a big push um, down in the lower part of the state is trying to get one of those um, set up as well. So and then right here, this picture, Benor Logistics, just right down the street, they have the state's first uh, fully electric truck. So and they they partnered with BMW on that. You guys have the only charging station for that at your facility. Um, it's a Peterbilt. Yep. Yeah, last year. And, and used. Well, they were leasing one last year. So now this is theirs that they actually own. Uh, they were awarded a grant through the South Carolina Ports Authority as well. So I think they've got four to six more on the way for this year as well. Um, and they'll be um, doing a charging, installing a charging station at Benora's site as well. I don't know exactly how long. I know it's got about a 150 mile round trip. Okay. Yeah. So it'll mainly just be used um, within the inland port. Yeah. So. But it's really cool. I mean, I was standing right beside it a couple of weeks ago at the event that they had, and um, I couldn't hear anything. And the guy came up to me, and he was like, you know, that's running, right? So it was, it was pretty cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what other is, is there other in investment in, in uh, other than electric into uh, you know, LNG or uh, hydrogen because I mean putting everything into one I don't I don't think so. Is, I don't think so. I think with especially with long haul, um, I don't think the batteries my personal opinion is the battery is not the way to go on that. I think something like hydrogen is going to be to be better. Uh, 
Stephen's actually moderating a panel at the Energy Summit tomorrow in Aiken, uh, speaking specifically about hydrogen and its uses. And I know BMW's previous president, um, I think he was more on the hydrogen train as well. Can you? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. For the consumer? It is. A TV, yeah. 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 Because the batteries right now, they do put a lot of additional weight in the truck. Um, so I think this one weighs about 8,000 pounds more than a normal truck, which is could be pretty significant depending on what you're hauling. Yeah, especially on the roads. Yeah, especially on the roads. So you got you got to think about that. There's a really cool pilot program happening out of Indiana right now where they, their asphalt that they're using on their roads will charge the car while it goes on it. So things like that, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for South Carolina within this, um, especially, you know, as, as I said, 186% growth in 10 years. So uh, it, there's really nothing to do but look up for the future of South Carolina and the automotive industry. Peterbilt. Peterbilt. Really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Volvo's got one. Okay. Volvo's got a really nice one. Tesla. Nikolai. Yeah. And Bo Bosch works with with them a good bit. I um I think too. So. Once it goes solid state, that's going to change everything. Yeah. Yeah. Quick question. I know that Michelin. We were talking about have the facility over there. Did you ever get a chance to go over there and see it? Yeah. Well, that's only for the internal. Yes, yeah. it's only for the forklifts. Yes, yeah. 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 Like BMW, all all tankers and forklifts in, in, within the assembly halls are hydrogen. Hydrogen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I know Keon down in Charleston yeah. Yeah. are in the hydrogen and electric forklift um, field as well. So, yeah. And Keon is the U.S. arm of. Yes. Yes. Exactly. yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is some of the findings from the study that I just kind of wanted to get out in front of you guys. Uh, these are the projected employment growth. So as you guys can see, you know, some of this, it's going to go down um, and increase depending because there's different components that make up the electric car versus the ICE cars. So South, as you guys can see here, South Carolina is in a pretty good position to increase their employment growth uh, within these industries by going, trending towards the electric cars. As I kind of hinted towards earlier, we are unveiling the first Palmetto Artificial Intelligence Corridor. Uh, this is basically a statewide working group of public and private academic in coordination with the governor's office, and it will help develop the state's first K-12 curriculum dedicated to AI instruction, um, awarding grants to companies. So you guys asked about that earlier, and then we will be working with the two and four year colleges uh, to target this as well. And as I mentioned, um, purchasing our very own spot as well. So pretty excited about that one. <laughs> Uh, so supply, uh, um, I will wrap up here, but supply chains will continue to become more complex and internationally dispersed. We need to know how to navigate the changing business landscape and adapting quickly. Uh, some additional things to look out for, um, the Flow Network, which is Freight Logistics op Optimization Works. It's a government-backed pilot program in which 18 entities, including private business, trucking, warehousing, and logistics companies, and ports will work to establish a proof of concept information exchange. It's being led by the US Department of Transportation. I'm not aware of any South Carolina companies that were asked to participate in this, but I do know that Georgia Ports Authority is one of the ports on that. I mean, it should be, right? It's the golden standard. Yeah, so this, was a this is a federal program, not, not a state program. Um, there's obviously, as you guys know, the chassis struggles, the China, China, China port lockdowns, and then you also had the union negotiations out west this summer. So 
all things to be on the lookout for supply chain. And then just concluding, um, SE Logistics work would not be complete without the support of our partners. So you can see here the partner network that makes up SC Logistics. And that'll do it. So I'll take any last questions. I got one. Um, so when you mentioned about uh, logistics companies that have less than 10 employees mm -hmm. counted, um, have they thought about how they're utilizing new service platforms like Uber Freights and stuff like that? Because there's always been those boards that we've used in the past to negotiate. Right, convoy to, and... To do deliveries, one single runs kind of stuff and, and uh, utilizing a board and they would kind of negotiate out who, mm -hmm. who that carrier would be for these small carrier groups. And those, the comments been that I saw a thing about was the fact that the customer could see in real time mm -hmm. where that truck was literally sitting mm -hmm. and not having to call about it. They could just look at their app and be like, oh, they're down on 95 in between so-and-so and you know there's an accident there. Yeah. And you kind of could see sight of that. Well, and Fraunhofer did a pretty cool project with G&P Trucking. They're, they're, they now were bought out by NFI. But they did a, a um, study basically showcasing that and developed, you know, a, a situation where and it improved the dispatcher's efficiency from dead loads and stuff, you know, that caused bottlenecks. I mean, it, it, I don't remember the exact number, but it was well into the double digits. So, but I don't. I, I don't know how we're, if we're capturing that. I would, need to I would need to check with Joey. I mean, I don't know how big it is. It's just interesting in the fact that a lot of the folks they spoke to, I mean, mm -hmm. mostly, of course, that's how some of that stuff goes. You get the positives, you know. Right. But that was their comment is, I get to control what I want to charge to pick up a load. Yeah. And they can find out in real time where I'm at instead of me having to constantly get right, call or email someone. Yeah. When they're calling me asking me where I'm at, yeah. they can see on their phone yeah. and tell. Yeah. And I, and I, I how much of that's going to change that small 10 person group when it's a team of two people yeah. and that's it. And well, and I mean, the own, like, I mean, own operator truck, I mean, he's one man, one company. I mean, he could be accounting for a huge amount of business, right? Yeah. Um, and we're, we're not showing that. That's why, you know, it says 37 billion, but I, I think it's probably a lot higher. Yeah, that's why I'm bringing it yeah. up, because I'm just curious about those technologies that are out there, how yeah. it's going to change that number. So. Well, I don't know, because it would still have the same impact, because you're still going to pay the same cost, you're still going to... But yeah, I mean, that, that might be something that I add for Joey's parameters. His, what he's what he all what he looks at and studies. Yeah, because there's some that are just pulling it out because of just the nature of how right. it is right now. Right. So. Yeah. Question on the Greer Inland Port. Yep. I know it's increasing again. Is yes. It doubling in size. <clears throat> it was. No. I don't. How are they going to do that? No, they <laughs> added. They added. <laughs> long, they added the spur and they. Yeah. Add, they add some more cranes. Crank, yeah. Yeah, a couple. Some more rail, right? Storage area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, dispersed so they can build longer trains. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think That's it's actually going trains. out. I think it's just the process. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm, I'm missing? I don't see any like ocean carriers on there, like MSC or somebody like that. And there's a corporate office down in Charles. They do. They're on my list. <laughs> <laughs> They're on my list. <laughs> Um, so we typically, uh, within SC Logistics, only invite one to three companies a year. Uh, it's, we kind of keep it small on purpose. Uh, but yes, they're, they're, they're on my list. Because <laughs> I think they give a pretty unique perspective. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? I want to put a comment in. SC Logistics is really interesting to be able to have an opportunity to be able to go down to Columbia and see some of these different things that they do and different individuals that get in there. It's, it's, I mean, I was part of Michelin at one time, now I'm retired, but still get involved with it because of what I see is going on there. It's, it's just a great opportunity to be able to see what's going on in the state and understanding how much logistics and supply chain involves the entire group. It, it just, it's fascinating to see yeah. how much is going on. 
Yeah. And he just, it's like, I'm this little piece of this humongous globe of different things that are going on. There. So. Yeah. It's pretty cool, and I mean, it's it's great. I mean, I enjoy it. I came from the freight forwarding background, so I was at a small freight forwarder doing export operations to start my career, and then I moved over to Kunanagel, and now I've been with the council for three years. So, I, I enjoy it. I get to talk to all sorts of different people. I really enjoy working with the schools because I did not study supply chain. I did, didn't really know anything about it. I went to Clemson, I majored in political science and biology and moved to Charleston kind of without a job, went into property management, had a friend who worked for Livingston International as a customs broker, and she goes, hey, you may really enjoy it, and you know, now 10 years, 11 years later. So um, anytime I can talk to the student about why they should get in logistics and supply chain, I'm, I'm pretty much all for it. Yeah, I'm curious to know what <clears throat> ends up happening with the fact that you know there is a trucker shortage is the fact that some companies are talking about trying to localize their supply their networks mm -hmm. instead of doing out all this stuff overseas no. because we've got what the new the new the new press shop that BMW yeah. unveiled this year and so Volvo's getting into the battery game just right on their site so I I, I think that'll be a huge trend moving forward um, I think just with everything that's been happening um, it just it just makes sense Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll put something provocative out there, too. So we had a, a person run for the United States president, Andrew Yang. He ran on a platform that we're going to eliminate truck drivers. Right. Yeah. Here. So we're going to fully automate the entire industry in a few years. That's a pretty provocative idea. Well, as of right now, you cannot drive, at least in South Carolina, I'm fairly certain you cannot have an autonomous vehicle on the road. It's illegal. So that will need to be changed. I live in Charleston. At least in my five to 10 years of driving up and down 26, I don't know if I would love being next to a car with nobody in it. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, there's that too, right? Right, right. But, um, but I mean, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's pilots and aviation, right? I mean, they really, they do that first mile and that last mile, and then everything else pretty much runs on a machine. And you, you put your life in their hands every day as well, so. He said it was like some, you know, soon time in the future. Yeah, he, yeah I mean, he predicted maybe 10 it was years be, from now. They said cashiers, you know, I mean, it was a whole bunch of jobs. He well, I, I was talking to one of my partners today, and they were like, you know, if I could go into a McDonald's and not talk to someone, that's fine with that's fine with me and we could use that workforce elsewhere right it's still it's still needed it's still important you're you're not going to get rid you're not going to have all these unemployed people that don't know where to work they're just going to be they're going to need to be higher skilled higher trained to work in you know the automotive industry the autonomous um the engineering exactly and you know and a lot of that goes into i mean you can get a great two-year degree from Trident Tech, Tri-County, Greenville Tech, um, and make a really good living. And it's, you know, trying to get rid of that narrative because you're not going to have just a huge generation just decide they want to get back into truck driving. So I just, I don't see that happening. So it's trying to figure out how to go about it. Yeah. I mean, the long distance or shorter distance, and then we'll only have to have the yeah. autonomous. And that's what they're talking about. They have to yeah. do like the, the short, yeah, have exactly. Have the train service that they want to work. I, I think, I think the future of rail is, is key. I think it's going to be very important, but you've got to be able to, to move it quick. You've got to be able to build. Um, right now, our infrastructure is not, not really set up for it, but I think it could be. I mean, you're, I, in my personal opinion, you have a better chance of doing something with the rail than you do widening 26 out or 85 out to 10, 12 lanes. I mean, that's not realistic. Or any, any supplier to BMW initially that wants to get closer. I mean, where are they going to locate? Right. Find the, a, the lane, and then you're still dealing with 85. Right. Or, yeah. mean, that's not going to get better. Yeah. Well, 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 you got to go off or down. Oh, okay. I can't think of anywhere else. They're still using just the existing rail lines. 
Are there plans to? I have a meeting with a rail carrier tomorrow. I'll ask and I'll let you guys know. What about so. the high speed from Atlanta to? I heard that's got approved. I heard that one got approved, right? And it's happening? Yeah. And I think they finally figured out the route. But I, I, don't, I don't know a timeline on that. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, right. Yes. Yeah. So. Remember All right. one acre of land you had? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's really a high speed line like in Europe. It needs to be totally separate and, and, and you know, security and, and then all that. And for them to even reach these speeds, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it would have to be a high. Yeah. You got too many. This is yeah. the south where people want their animals want their Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's dangerous out there. So. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, yeah.